Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that introduction. I have no idea what was said, but I, I, I hope it was nice. Um, but I have an idea for you. You could get Gordon Brown to give a seminar here, and you could introduce him also in Icelandic, and um, <laughs> you, you could say whatever you wish to say about him, uh, and um, you could get your own back for him having called you or, or treated you as a nation of terrorists, um, which, uh, for, for which I, I must uh, apologize. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for, for, for the invitation to talk about the financial crisis. I don't know that much about the uh, financial crisis specifically um, in relation to Iceland, but I, I, I have thoughts at least to put into the uh, discussion ab about the Iceland Icelandic situation. I want to talk more about the financial crisis in general and how it evolved in the United States and how it spread from the United States um, to the United Kingdom, because without certain... Um, Without a certain regulatory and, um, and, and other problems which developed within the United States, there would not have been a worldwide financial crisis, even if there had been a financial crisis in some specific country. But my thesis is really not that um, regulators always cause financial crashes or that governments in other ways always cause financial crashes, simply that we cannot rely on regulators or governments to prevent financial crashes. And the best that we can do, as I'll explain at the end, I think is to put in place a legal framework to ensure that when banks do make mistakes, it is those who provide capital to banks who suffer from those mistakes, um, and that we can have an orderly winding up of financial institutions and banks uh, which actually um, uh, suffer from catastrophic uh, losses. So um, if you like, uh, people, of course, will make mistakes in markets, in business, in banks, in finance, um, but we do not have some kind of perfect regulator and perfect government, on the, on the other hand, that, that can somehow correct the market for that um, possibility and potential to, to make mistakes. And instead, we have to look at a different way of dealing with the problems which arose in the financial crisis. So the typical view of the uh, crash in the UK and the US um, is that unregulated laissez-faire capitalism uh, was allowed to let rip and uh, the greed of bankers motivated by bonus packages um, led to an un unprecedented degree of risk taking. Now interestingly, almost exactly the same sort of thing was said after the Wall Street crash of 1929, but subs subsequent reflection and um, subsequent uh, research proved that view of the Wall Street crash to be very largely uh, mistaken. And it's, of course, impossible to untangle um, the many factors which gave rise to the financial crash, and my talk doesn't uh, try to provide some kind of, um, uh, or make some kind of empirical judgments uh, in, in that way. But my real point here was that there was a tide. There were problems within financial markets, and that regulators, central banks, and governments in other respects swam with that tide, and they encouraged the tide, they encouraged the sorts of mistakes that were being made uh, in financial markets and did nothing um, at, at all to um, make the crash less likely or its effects um, less harmful than they might otherwise have been. Now, it's now quite widely accepted that the boom and bust that culminated in the Great Depression in the 1930s uh, arose as a result of catastrophically mismanaged monetary policy. And the same was true of, of the Japanese boom, bust and malaise of the late uh, 20th and early 21st century. So before we start looking at other causes of the financial crash, I think we ought to also examine whether loose monetary policy was an important cause, uh, again, in the, uh, in the, of the crash of 2008 uh, in the United States. And so it turns out to be. Um, for six years from 2001, the US Federal Reserve uh, sent the message to participants in financial markets that if markets were to fall, the Fed would underpin them. Loose monetary policy led to a financial bubble, um, and uh, an asset price boom, low saving, and high levels of, of consumption. Higher asset prices then uh, raise the value of collateral against secured loans, and this, of course, encouraged more lending. Um, and this, combined with mark-to-market -market accounting, uh, raised accounting profits. Low interest rates also encouraged unsustainable borrowing, um, consumption, uh, and investment in the housing market, and exacerbated the problem of um, uh, global imbalances. Now, it's tempting to uh, dismiss these uh, issues as mere technicalities and argue that if only bankers had behaved more ethically, 
uh, the whole crash would never have happened. But the, the problem is that monetary policy, together with some of the other factors that I'll, I'll talk about um, in a moment, distorts price signals in a way that makes it very difficult for those operating in banks and other financial markets to discern exactly what is prudent and ethical behavior. If interest rates are held down, consumers will naturally borrow more money. Uh, those who want to buy a house will naturally um, borrow more money against the value uh, of those houses, believing that the decrease in interest rates is genuine and permanent rather than artificially engineered by a central bank. If a monetary boom raises asset prices, people will borrow against those inflated asset prices, believing it to be entirely rational uh, to do so. So the price system loses its coordinating function within financial markets. And in this regard, some key figures, I think, uh, are worth mentioning. In the US, the federal funds rate, the key short-term interest rate, was cut from 6.25% to 1.75% in 2001. There was a real fear, an entirely irrational fear, in my view, of deflation after the tech bubble burst in 2001. It was then cut further and was held at 1% until mid-2004. And the Fed's fund rate was negative for two and a half years in the three-year period 2002 to 2004. If the Fed had applied a Taylor rule, which was uh, quite commonly used to determine interest rates uh, within the, uh, by, by the Federal Reserve, during this uh, period, the Fed funds rate would have been somewhere between 2% and 5% in the period 2001 to 2005. Now, these problems arose to a, less, to a lesser extent in, in other countries. Uh, in the UK, for example, we had very rapid money supply growth, uh, which had rose to 14, over 14% 14 per annum um, by September 2007. Now, there are a lot of reasons why these monetary policy mistakes took place. It was quite a difficult environment in which to um, conduct monetary policy. In particular, the capital flows from uh, Asia due to the um, a huge increase in savings in Asia uh, led to a fall in world real interest rates. And central bankers had a difficult job to do uh, in these circumstances. But I think what was particularly dangerous, I'll mention this again later, was the apparent underpinning of asset markets by, um, uh, through the use of monetary policy the adjustment of interest rates in the US um, uh, uh, financial system. I'll, I'll, I'll refer again to that in a moment. Now, in addition to that, if you look at this so-called um, great uh, uh, capitalist land, the land of the free, the United States, we have an extraordinary degree of um, intervention in the financial system and an extraordinary degree of government's underwriting of financial risk which isn't replicated anywhere else um, in the Western world, M maybe not e even in, in the world. And I've uh, got to talk about one or two examples uh, of this. Um, Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac, two uh, US-sponsored, um, uh, certainly implicitly, and as it turned out, explicitly backed by the US government, government um, uh, agencies, had a commitment to spend $2 trillion expanding home ownership amongst low-income earners and minorities. All of this was underwritten by the US government. The securitization process was underwritten by the US federal government. 40% of the loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bought from banks and then securitized in 2007 and 2008 were either subprime loans um, made to uh, high-risk uh, borrowers or what are known as Alt-A loans made without any documentation, the so-called no income, no jobs um, uh, borrowers. And again, these were um, underwritten by the US government. At one point, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these two government-backed mortgage securitization warehouses, were leveraged 100 to 1. And these two institutions either owned or guaranteed about half of all US uh, mortgages. When, the, financial, when the, the final accounting is done, it's likely that these two um, government-backed securitization houses will cost the US taxpayer around $200 billion. In addition to this, you have very weak personal bankruptcy law. Again, quite unusual in the Western world. Uh, in half of US states, mortgages are non-recourse, um, uh, so that um, the borrower 
should the value of the house decline below the value of his mortgage, could just put the keys in the door and walk away from the house. I know people who have done that, leaving the bank um, with the debt. The, actual, the, 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 bor the borrower um, who takes out the mortgage, um, the, the bank has no recourse to the other assets of that borrower. Again, another aspect of moral hazard within the US financial system. Um, furthermore, we've had US federal deposit insurance now for about 70 years. That deposit insurance is supposed to be risk-based. In other words, banks are supposed to pay higher premiums to the Federal Reserve if their balance sheets are more risky. Yet since 1979, those, risk premium, th those um, premiums were never adjusted to allow for changes in risk between individual banks or the overall increase in risk within the financial system. And again, the taxpayer essentially here is then taking responsibility for the mistakes which banks uh, make and encouraging banks to take greater risks than they otherwise uh, would have done. Throughout several decades, we had the continuing bailing out of the US financial system. We had the savings and loans crisis in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, where the uh, US government um, bailed out those institutions, and then, slightly different case, long-term capital management, and then a, a number of particular uh, cases as well where the US government got involved in bailing out financial institutions. And then, of course, we had the huge bailout in 2007, uh, sorry, 2008, uh, 2009. Now, I've already mentioned the uh, mismanaged, or what I regard as, as mismanaged monetary policy. One aspect of, of this was that monetary policy seemed to be used, and certainly it became perceived by market participants that it was being used to underpin um, financial markets. So if stock market values started falling, um, Greenspan would reduce interest rates. I mean, this was a phenomenon that was um, sufficiently um, widely uh, understood and perceived that it was given the name the Greenspan put. Um, in other words, if you bought <coughs> stocks, Greenspan would give you a put option on those stocks by reducing interest rates if their value fell. Now, this had several problems. Again, it reinforced moral hazard, but also the models that were used by banks in order to assess risk were, of course, based upon the empirical um, evidence with regard to the fluctuations in security prices. And so if those fluctuations were dampened down, especially on the, the downside by the central bank, banks would be using um, inappropriate models when trying to assess their risk and underestimating um, their, their risks. Now, this wasn't something which kind of has been uh, invented uh, after the event uh, in a sort of process of ex post rationalization. It was something that was widely understood um, well before the crisis. And the Times, in fact, in Britain, said in 2000, eight years before the financial crisis, that Greenspan had encouraged a destructive tendency towards excessive risky investment supported by hopes that the Fed will help if things go bad. So that's a prediction eight years before the crash. Now, all of this has many effects, um, none of which are, are desirable. Incentives to monitor are, are reduced significantly when markets expect bailouts. Guarantees also mean that um, markets don't send price signals in terms of widened bond spreads. If bondholders expect bailouts, then you will not get the widening of bond spreads, which is so important in communicating credit risk uh, within markets. And throughout the world, um, Ireland, another example, and the US, the UK, um, bondholders were bailed out in the financial crisis. I think that's one of the most regrettable uh, aspects of uh, what, what happened, um, in fact. The too big to fail problem is then self-fulfilling because the bigger financial institutions are able to access capital more cheaply because those who provide capital to bigger financial institutions expect to be bailed out so they don't demand su such high uh, cost of capital. And this was uh, something which has been uh, widely recognized in the UK and a lot of discussion about it uh, has, has taken place. If we underpin the financial system with guarantees, people are also insulated from the consequences of their own actions. And so they take actions that are more risky because the risks of their um, of their actions are socialized. Prudence, in a sense, in economic terms, prudence becomes a public good, um, have public good qualities. Uh, and uh, as we all know, public goods are underprovided. Depositors 
get the benefits of taking uh, greater risks through higher interest rates, but do not bear the cost of that risk taking because of deposit insurance. Now, it's interesting to look at the US and UK banking system before um, the, the 1930s. In fact, the UK, UK banking system was very lightly regulated until the 1980s. Um, but the, uh, in the, the US banking system was uh, then became more tightly regulated during the 1930s. Before the US banking system, uh, before deposit insurance was introduced into the US banking system, US banks usually had an equity capacity of 20 to 30 percent of total assets. During the rest of the 20th century, after deposit, uh, after deposit insurance was instituted, this figure never rose to more than 10 percent. If you look at the UK banking system, um, we had a rich variety of financial institutions. There was no deposit insurance in the UK until 1979. And customers could choose between institutions that paid lower interest rates, and which were known to keep more capital, um, they were known as trustee savings banks and building societies, or banks which were known to be um, riskier but would pay higher interest rates. Once deposit insurance was introduced, those other institutions paying lower interest rates were just wiped out. They converted themselves um, into banks. I gather you had Matt Ridley here not long ago. He was the chairman of Northern Rock, which was precisely one of those institutions which converted itself from a building society um, into a bank. In the UK, um, in the late 19th century, there was no regulation of banks. Many banks were unlimited liability or shareholders had double liability in order to signal to depositors that the shareholders had more skin in the game. The shareholders were going to lose more if something went wrong um, with, with the bank. And um, there were these incentives, uh, w um, or, or rather the absence of the uh, underwriting of risk by government provided incentives for prudent um, behavior. Now, ultimately, I think a, a credible policy has to be developed, and there have been some, some moves in the right direction here, to ensure that banks can fail and can fail safely with those who provide capital to those banks actually uh, bearing the cost of that failure, and I shall come back to that um, at the end. Now, many have um, blamed, not entirely unfairly, the development of securitization and other complex products for making the banking system more <coughs> opaque and contributing to the financial crash. Now, I've no doubt that these securitization instruments were at least to some extent um, important, but I think we have to ask two pertinent questions. Firstly, why was there so much securitization of lending? And secondly, why was so much of that securitization, um, securitization of lending, which was to inherently bad risks, poor risks um, in the US. And the unintended consequences of, of regulation, a, again, I'm afraid, is one of the problems uh, here. <coughs> um, by 2005, the US mortgage giants had explicit targets to provide over 50% of their financing to people on below median incomes. Subprime lending was encouraged by something called the Community Reinvestment Act. Some people have suggested that this is a major cause of the crash. That, that's factually incorrect. It, it's not a major cause of the crash, but it was something that contributed it to it in some way. It was part of the zeitgeist, if you like, of the time of encouraging banks to do uh, reckless things. Um, the Boston Fed's supervision manual, and a lot of this was actually, a lot of this pushing of lending out to poor risks was done um, through uh, soft coercion rather than by legislation. The Boston Fed's supervision manual instructs lenders to use procedures to, to um, determine whether to lend to a particular risk that are appropriate to the economic culture of urban, lower income, and non-traditional customers. They were being pushed to lend money to people who had no real record of taking out credit and repaying, that those loan, uh, repaying loans. And banks were warned that it would be fined $500,000 um, if they were sued for discrimination. In 2004, Greenspan encouraged credit institutions to move away from fixed rate mortgages to variable rate mortgages, which they did. And it was actually the rise in short-term interest rates that triggered the subprime crisis. There's nothing wrong intrinsically with variable rate mortgages. In the UK, nearly all um, mortgages are variable rate mortgages. 
But there was a tradition of fixed rate mortgages uh, in the US and Greenspan encouraged a decisive move away from that tradition at exactly the wrong time. International regulation also played its part and I'm very fearful about uh, international banking regulation uh, in general. Um, the Basel Banking Accord in, in 1988 and its successor Basel II uh, led to two, cons two uh, undesirable consequences. <coughs> Firstly, they distorted the activities of banks, encouraging <coughs> them to take on more and more gearing in more and more complex ways, but to give the impression that they'd offloaded that, the risk from their balance sheets through the process of securitization, packaging up the loans and selling those loans to um, a, a, a third party and taking them off the bank's own balance sheet. So the capital ratios for banks could be reduced by securitizing loans, even if some of the risk was actually kept on the bank's balance sheets. Indeed, you could get a situation whereby a bank could um, make a series of loans to borrowers. They would then package those loans up in a set of securities, sell those securities to other investors, and the, that same bank could then buy another set of identical securities, and if those securities were rated AAA, the bank would um, significantly reduce its capital requirements, despite the fact that it has exactly the same risk. Well, of, of course, banks did precisely that. Um, they played that game, and they made the financial system more and more complex and opaque uh, in the process. This then, of course, encouraged the rating agencies to overrate um, securities. Um, I don't want to defend the, the rating agencies in particular, but we should remember that rating agencies simply exist to provide opinions on the credit worthiness of borrowers, whether it be banks or sovereign nations. Once those um, rating agencies are dragged into the um, uh, regulatory system, and once regulators say to banks, if you buy securities which have a particular credit rating, um, then those rating agencies, and there are only a small number of them, because the, uh, the, the US regulator created an um, oligopoly in this business through, it, through its licensing procedures, um, one, once you um, give banks some kind of advantage if they buy securities with a particular credit rating, you distort the incentives that those credit rating agencies um, face. And again, this was a pretty serious um, problem and something that was entirely caused by the um, uh, um, unforeseen consequences of regulation. I should say unforeseen by and large by anybody. I'm not standing here uh, s suggesting that I pre predicted these consequences uh, in advance. Secondly, um, international uh, regulators uh, through Basel II encouraged the adoption of um, similar types of risk models throughout the banking system. And then when those risk models turn out to be flawed, um, it affected the whole system at the same time. So, and these models, quite, quite interesting actually, what, what, um, uh, what happened when in relation to the uh, theory of banking regulation that, that academics often think about. Um, these models were designed to reduce the probability of failure of individual banks by requiring them or measuring, by measuring, how much capital those banks um, should have to keep in order to reduce their probability of failure to a level that was acceptable to the regulator. Now, if you read the banking, um, your, your banking regulatory textbooks, they normally tell you that the, um, what, hap what should happen when a bank fails is that you should allow the bank to fail. You shouldn't discourage failure at all. You should allow the bank to fail, but make sure the system keeps going. What Basel II did was precisely, precisely the opposite. Basel, uh, the Basel Capital Accords made it less likely that a bank, an individual bank, would fail because of these high uh, regulatory capital requirements designed to reduce the probability of failure. But because all banks were regulated in the same way, but pretty much throughout the world, with some exceptions such as Canada, um, it made it almost certain that if banks did fail, they all, fa sorry, they all failed at the same time, thereby bringing down the financial system. In other words, it made systemic, um, it actually institutionalized systemic risk, achieved precisely the, exact, the, the, precisely the opposite of what we normally would like to see from banking regulation. 
in addition to this, um, government policy throughout the world um, has given incentives for banks to finance themselves through debt rather than equity. In most tax regimes, particularly in the US, to some extent in the UK, um, normally, but not always throughout Europe, there are some exceptions, certainly like Ireland, ironically Ireland, given what happened there. Um, but there, in most tax regimes, um, all companies have an incentive to finance themselves by debt rather than equity because of the penal tax treatment of equity finance. And, uh, and um, the Vickers report in the UK has suggested that the tax system was a significant factor in making equity capital more expensive for banks than debt capital, which is the precise opposite of what we'd really like in a banking system. Now, it might be nice to think we can um, perhaps deal with all these problems by bet having better regulators. We've got a banking system which might be prone to fragility if people behave in a particular way. Um, that's okay. Let's just find some omniscient, non-self-interested regulators who can sort the problem um, out. Well, as I've suggested, such omniscient, omniscient non-self-interested regulators don't exist. And economic theory tells us that they are unlikely ever to exist. Well, they won't ever exist. Um, regulation in general will often be diverted away from its proper economic objectives by incentives within regulatory bureaus. And this leads to a number of practical effects, especially in financial markets. Regulators will tend to discharge their duties by simply writing regulatory rules. In the UK, the so-called light touch approach to regulation, as people called it, involved our financial services authority having a manual that was a million paragraphs long. Um, within those million paragraphs, there are actually no regulatory um, um, Regu regulatory constraints, as far as I could find, it obviously takes quite a long time to, uh, uh, to, to look, um, which related to the kind of liquidity problems that Northern Rock had. Um, politicians, to whom regulators are ultimately accountable, will often follow what is sometimes described as the interventionist's um, fallacy. When a problem arises, everyone cries, something must be done. Politicians find something and they do it regardless of whether or not it's the right thing to do in the long term. Um, regulators will, be ten will tend to be risk averse. They will want to try to regulate banks to avoid a failure uh, on their own watch. So they will be prone to over-regulation on the whole. But, and this is an important but, and we've seen this happening uh, with something called the LIBOR scandal in, in the UK in the last um, few months. If a failure does happen, then the regulator has every incentive to pretend that there isn't a problem in the hope that markets will improve and the bank's position will, um, will improve and the problem will go away. So you have, on the one hand, this problem that regulators are too risk averse, but on the other hand, when you want them to act, the regulator has every incentive um, not to act and just to wait and hope the problem will go away. A sort of gamble to resurrection approach. You might think that that is happening um, in the Eurozone at the, at the moment with regard to um, problems there. In addition to that, regulators will be captured, a particular problem I think in the US, by those whom they're trying to regulate. The traffic between Goldman Sachs and the US Treasury is something which uh, concerns me greatly. The Goldman Sachs now and the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, we're getting a, an ex-Goldman Sachs uh, um, executive as our governor of, of the Bank of England. Um, uh, so regulators will tend to be captured by those they are trying to regulate. And um, uh, you know, uh, as, as such, they will not necessarily act benignly in the public interest. Now, there are also lessons from Austrian economics. It's simply not possible for regulators to gather all the information um, that is necessary to regulate a market effectively. Uh, and indeed, you can argue that's what they were trying to do before the crisis. Regulators were trying to develop models which would tell all banks in the world exactly how much capital they should hold given their risks. And it's um, interesting to note that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had 236 regulators all to themselves um, in the US. And um, as we've seen, those institutions have cost, uh, cost us about $200 billion, about a billion dollars a regulator. <laughs> um, now, some regulators have criticized, quite rightly, the, the unethical behavior of market participants. However, ethics and virtue, I speak here as somebody who writes quite a lot actually about Catholic social teaching, 
ethics and virtue are things which need to be practiced. And in financial markets, they need to be underpinned uh, by prudence. And I do think that the conduct of monetary policy and the, the other regulatory developments, particularly in the United States, actually distorted price signals in a way that rewarded imprudent behavior and made it very difficult for market practitioners to discern the difference between ethical and unethical behavior. And also, if you create a situation whereby the um, profits of banks are, as has been suggested by one politician in the UK, are privatized and the losses are socialized, sort of people into the banking industry. You attract people who are blind risk takers who are not prudent because they're not facing the consequences of their own uh, action. So what should we do? Well, m my contention really is, that, um, is not that we have some kind of perfect banking system, nor that we'll ever have some kind of perfect <laughs> banking system where there will be no failures, no problems, no financial bubbles. Uh, my contention is that we, the best uh, we can hope for, given the imperfections amongst regulators, is a financial system whereby where there is failure, that failure happens relatively safely. And that, that um, discipline, ensuring that banks can fail safely and ensuring that those who provide the capital to banks, particularly bondholders, but also to a greater extent depositors, that that process will in itself discipline and make banks more um, prudent. And there are several ways in which this can be um, achieved. I'm not necessarily saying I um, believe in, all, in, in, in following all of these proposals. Some of them are good, some of them not quite so good. Firstly, if we do have deposit insurance at all, we didn't have deposit insurance, as I mentioned, in the UK until 1979. It's not necessary. But if you do have deposit insurance, um, whether it's organized by the market or by the central bank, it should be, the premiums for it should be risk-based. Um, secondly, I think you can argue there's a very good case for making all depositors within a bank, particularly if you have deposit insurance. It doesn't really matter quite so much if you don't have deposit insurance, but especially if you have deposit insurance, senior creditors. So this makes sure that all the other creditors of the bank who provide capital to the bank lose everything before depositors lose anything. And if you, if you do that, you'll find actually in nearly all bank failures, depositors will be okay, depositors will be safe. Um, thirdly, um, we can have, and this is, this is being implemented in the UK and I think um, also in, other, uh, in the EU more generally, living wills and other legal mechanisms to ensure that banks can be wound up easily in the event of a failure. And I think one of the most unsavory aspects of the present crisis, as I keep uh, repeating, was that the providers of debt capital um, retained most or all of their money. Fourthly, I think there should be, um, um, sorry, fifthly, uh, I, I think there should be uh, um, more provision to ensure that banks publish the detail of their exposures to the market. It's important that the main, um, that the main relationships are not between banks and their regulators. That's a recipe for regulatory capture. The most important relationships should be between banks and the market. And if this involves a regulator requiring banks to publish more information to the market, well, all well, well and good. Sixthly, I think banks should have contingent debt capital that can be converted into equity capital. Again, that's something that's coming. And um, also, uh, as I mentioned, we need a complete revision of the way in which equity capital is taxed to ensure that it's not penalized within the tax system. Now, regulators are um, uh, uh, doing a lot of these things, but they're also doing a lot of, um, uh, um, a, a lot of damaging things too. Now, for example, in the UK, uh, we're going way beyond international capital requirements and requiring the bigger banks to hold huge amounts of risk-weighted capital. In other words, we're trying to create a system where the big banks will never fail rather than a system where banks will fail safely if they do fail. And this is a recipe, um, I think, also for restricting competition. If you're going to have competition within a banking system, you need some sort of mechanism to ensure that those banks that fail can fail safely and that new capital can come into the system and you can have innovation and, and so on. In addition, there is simply no end to the bureaucratic rule writing that um, I think caused so many problems in the early 21st century. 
In 2011, worldwide, there were 14,200 new banking regulations. The US Dodd-Frank Act will probably have 30,000 pages of associated regulations. Uh, regulators are paid to write rules. One can never doubt their efficiency. Um, but this is greatly damaging and leads again to a situation where the only people who understand banking regulation are those who are intimately connected with the system, and that uh, increases the likelihood of regulatory capture. 30 years ago, any intelligent person in this room with two or three months' effort could probably have understood the major regulatory um, uh, environments in banking systems you know, right throughout the world, six or seven of them, quite easily. Now it's almost impossible to understand how banks and other aspects of the financial system are being regulated. Now, what about Iceland? Um, well, it's clear that there was very reckless behaviour um, in the case of um, the three major Icelandic banks. I think some of the, the fingerprints of the typical causes of bank crises were clearly there too in the Icelandic case. Um, my information here is somewhat second-hand, I should say. There was a monetary boom in the early 21st century. It appears too that the central bank was lending directly to the um, commercial banking system on pretty favourable terms and creating a large pool of liquidity. This is pretty dangerous um, stuff. Thirdly, I think there is an area here for genuine debate within the European Union. The European Union doesn't want to have this um, debate. I'm not in favour of regulation in general, but I am in favour of having legal frameworks that ensure that contracting parties uh, can actually um, have their, the, the aims of those contracts realised. And this requires a system, uh, as I keep mentioning, for winding up banks safely. My fear is that um, the system of um, of internationalizing banking through branching, which happens um, at the discretion of regulators quite a lot throughout the world in general, but is actually a requirement on European Union countries. Um, I think this is pretty dangerous. I'm not suggesting that, uh, let, let's take Iceland and, and the UK as an example. So the Icelandic banks on the whole operated through branches um, in the UK rather than through separately capitalised subsidiaries. Um, I, I think this exacerbated the risks. It made, him, it, made it much less easy for um, UK customers to understand the risks of investing um, in Icelandic banks and also the protection that they were going to get from deposit insurance systems. But more importantly, when it came to dealing with the fallout of the crisis and actually winding these institutions up, it became much more complex. Um, you know, as Mervyn, uh, Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, said, uh, banks tend to be international in their operations, but they have to be national uh, when, when they die. They have to be um, actually wound up under somebody's legal um, framework. And I think it should be um, absolutely within the power of a um, central bank to say to um, a particular bank that your operations are too complex. We don't like the fact that you're operating internationally through um, this range of branches. If you don't actually um, establish separate international subsidiaries, then we will not provide you with lender of last resort um, facilities. In other words, lender of last resort facilities should almost be um, offered on a conditional or a contractual um, uh, basis. As I say, I don't really see this as regulation. I see this as just ensuring that you have a... a um, proper, coordinated, and coherent legal framework. That sort of thing would be illegal in the European Union, and the European Union do not want those types of regulatory actions to be legal. Not because it would stop free trade, it wouldn't stop free trade, you could still have free trade between subsidiaries, but because the European Union elite want to create a European Union super state, so the idea of operating with one head office somewhere in Europe and all other countries through branches is something that's actually very attractive for Brussels, even though it's very damaging to the banking system. So, in summary, um, my fear is, um, well, I know that we will not find regulators who will perfect um, our banking system. My fear is that we will never find uh, regulatory systems which will, do, which will do anything other than actually make banking crises uh, worse. I think it's important that we don't try to seek a banking system in which banks never fail. What is important is that we um, seek uh, 
to achieve something which is achievable, uh, which is that we have a banking system where when there is a failure of a bank, this happens in a relatively orderly and safe manner and doesn't involve bringing down the rest of the financial system. Thanks.